Are you curious about what yoga looks like off the mat or keen to hear how yogis all around the world live? This show will let you in on the secret that there's no such thing as a perfect yogi. Welcome to the Plant Powered Yoga Podcast. Please welcome your host, yoga teacher, coffee lover, vegan, and known as the Plant Powered Yogi, Jess Ivers. Hello and welcome to the very first episode of the Plant Powered Yoga Podcast. My name is Jess, thank you so much for being here. Today's episode is all about the best things that I learned on my yoga teacher training. And this episode is focused on my first yoga teacher training, which I did back in 2017 in Ubud in Bali with Radiantly Alive Yoga School. It was a 200 hour intense three week or four week training three and a half weeks in total. And it was one of the hardest and challenging things that I've ever done. I didn't know what to expect. And I went into it probably a little too ambitious. Looking back now, I was really prepared. Well, I thought I was really prepared for this training. I booked it in months and months ahead. I was super serious about my practice and I was training every day, trying to get as physically fit as possible. But I was going to yoga, I was practicing lots and really pushing myself to be what I thought was the best yogi. And so I get to Bali and that idea is almost flipped on its head. And I don't know about any other yoga teachers who might be listening, but this might have happened to you as well, maybe when you did your training. And my mindset around yoga has changed a lot in the last three years since that first training. And even in the second training that I'm undertaking now, it's definitely not about pushing yourself or that perfect poses exist or that to be able to be a proper yogi, you have to be practicing for six hours a day. Um, Definitely not all about that. So I'm gonna share the top 10 things that I learned on my yoga teacher training back in 2017. Starting with a good teacher depends on who I am when I'm teaching, not what my yoga looks like. I know I got really worried about stepping into a teaching role and being concerned that I couldn't do handstands or headstands or even say get into a full Hanumanasana split. I really worried that that was going to come across in a really bad way as a teacher. How could I be at the front of the class teaching when I can't even fit into these poses or these shapes that look so wonderful? And I realized that it's not about that. No one really does care uh, if you can do a handstand, headstand, if you can do all these amazing things with your body. And I think as well, it reiterated to me that yoga is not there as a way for the teacher to show off at the front of the class. It's about being there for your students and guiding them through something. So it depends on who I am being when I'm teaching, not what I look like. And so I hope that resonates maybe with some people. If you are also having that doubt about your teaching ability because of what you might look like. Number two on the list is be serious about your practice, but not serious about life. And there was quite a lot of yoga life talk, how yoga really represents a lot of our life uh, that in this list and a lot of what I learned on my teacher training. I really like this one because it is about when you step on your mat, that's your time, that's your space to be in your zone and in your practice. And for a lot of us, we wish we could maybe do yoga all the time and be in this great yogi state, but sometimes it is only when we come to step on our mat and come to be in those four corners that that's where we can really sink ourselves into the practice and really absorb all of the wonderful benefits of it. Whether that helps anyone else listening, maybe that when you step on your mat the next time, but just know that that's your little safe space for you anyway. And that's your little spot of comfort, your place to be as serious as you want about your practice and also knowing that it doesn't have to be taken so seriously. If we have a little wobble on our mat at any stage, a little rock and roll here and there, we can just laugh about it. Number three, again, all this life and yoga combination, that yoga is a safe place to practice life. And this one has really stuck with me for so long and I've probably said it a hundred times in some of my classes um, when I've been teaching. One of the teachers on my training gave the example that, yeah, when we maybe fall over on our mat or we do something a little bit silly or something might happen, 
that we don't get too hard on ourselves and we don't criticize ourselves. We just have a little laugh and we joke about it and go, that's okay, I'm gonna pick myself up and I'm gonna try again. Sometimes, I know for me that when that happens in life, I can get really down on myself and really hard on myself if I make a mistake with something or make a bad judgment call that I can turn around and be really, really hard on myself. Whereas in yoga, if one day on my mat I'm in a tree shape and I might fall out, instead of having a go at myself, I just have a little giggle. Or maybe it's when one day I might be in a class where they might be practicing headstands and instead of maybe pushing myself that day, uh, I realize and go, mm, today's not the day for inversions for me and making that call. Rather than getting ourselves really caught up in the seriousness of it all, that it is a really safe space for us to practice our own lives. Coming in at number four on the list is that in yoga, there is no end goal. And that is why it is called a practice. And again, this is a really one that resonates with me because a lot of times when I tell people that I'm a yoga teacher, I get asked if I can do a certain shape or people will tell me that they can do something or oh, I'm, I'm so close to being able to get into a full crow. Um, I just have to, I just have to keep practicing or I've just got to keep doing it. And that's exactly it. There's no end goal. So sometimes there are days where we can be practicing something for so long and we might reach the peak pose or the peak shape that we might be interested in. But then other days we might not get there either. And there's days where arm balances, inversions, back bends all seem like they are the easiest things in the world. And then other days where they feel like you've never ever done them before. Yes, it's practice, but the practice should never be about the physical end goal because nothing happens trust me uh, if you can hold a crow shape or you can hold a pinch of my rasana uh, for 10 seconds you don't reach enlightenment i'm really sorry to tell you that but <laughs> it's all about the practice and what comes with that and again bringing it back to yoga on the mat and off the mat that yoga is that fun place where we can practice all of these things but never ever think about the end goal. That means we're not living in the present moment. We're thinking way too far ahead. In yoga, not worrying about the end goal, worrying about the practice itself. Next up on the list is that while the philosophy of yoga is an ancient practice, the poses are really only less than about a hundred years old. We think of yoga and we think of it as this really beautiful ancient tradition, which it really is, but the physical practice of vinyasa yoga or ashtanga yoga is actually a really young practice. It has only been practicing for yeah less than a hundred years and that's something that was a bit of a shock to me I thought I knew a lot about yoga and I just imagined that thousands and thousands of years ago people were flowing and moving in these beautiful ways but it was actually created for young Indian boys young Indian gymnasts and that's how we got a lot of the shapes and the movements that we get today so while the mindfulness meditation and the philosophy aspect of yoga is a really ancient practice and a really beautiful one at that. Um, when you step into a vinyasa class, um, unfortunately it's not not an old-fashioned uh, ancient practice. I'm really sorry to, <laughs> to burst your bubble on that one. Aligning both of those in our physical movement I think is what makes yoga really really special. Number six on the list is that yoga is not a one-size-fits-all. Bodies are not made to everything. And this is another kind of myth busting thing about yoga. I find that, again, there's the aspect of, oh, well, if we practice enough, then we'll be able to get into that shape. And it's a knowledge that all our bodies are very, very different. And the way that my body's made is gonna be so different to the way that everybody in a class that I might be facilitating is made as well. And what I can do with my body might be different to you who's listening, what you can do with your body. And while we can direct cues and direct you into ways and shapes with your body, I will never know how it feels to be in your body. Knowing as well that we can't force anyone into a shape. I always was a bit worried about myself. I always thought that my body wasn't a yoga body because at first I wasn't super flexible. Some days touching my toes does seem like a really hard thing to do. Again, a little bit of a myth busting that just because you can do all these things with your body doesn't mean you're a yogi. I really hope to shit talk a lot about this topic a lot more in the coming episodes with a lot of people that yogis come in all different shapes and sizes and never ever compare yourself to anyone else that you might see that can do things because your body is wonderful and amazing exactly the way it is. Next up is resting when you need to is really important. 
I really don't like the hustle mentality that has come with a lot of people starting their own businesses or starting their own side hustle. Uh, just even that word makes me cringe a little bit. Isn't it nice to know that in yoga, we do all of this amazing work for 50 minutes, 55 minutes in an hour class, and then right at the end, we get to rest. And you know, they sometimes they say that the best part about yoga is the nap that you get at the end, but I tend to not look at it as a nap, but more of a respect for our body and an appreciation of the hard work that it's just done. So we get through 50 minutes of doing, say, a really strong vinyasa class. You get to lie there at the end and just let all of that amazing energy float through your body. Or even if it's a gentle class, even if it's a yin class, where you might have done some really soft movements, not gotten your heart rate up at all, but there's still that appreciation and respect for your body at the very end. And that comes also during a class, acknowledging that when you need to rest, you're allowed to rest. And that's one of my favorite things about a yoga practice is that there should never be any judgment in a room or a place where you're practicing yoga, that you can rest when you need to. And if you came into my class and you got halfway through and decided to sit in a child's shape for half an hour, that would be absolutely okay with me and knowing that resting when you need is super, super important. Number eight is that everyone finds yoga in their different way. So my story is finding yoga. I practiced a little bit when I was a teenager. Wasn't really anything super special to me at that time, but then found yoga coming into it my own way. Not long after I moved to Melbourne and was really dealing with a lot of anxiety uh, and mental health issues. So yoga was my way of something to get out of the house and go to and do. Some people find it that way. Other people have been practicing for a really, really long time. Some people find it through that they might have been dancers or athletes or gymnasts and yoga complemented their lifestyle in a really good way. Like before, that there's no one size fits all for yoga. There's no one size fits all for the way that everyone finds yoga. And you might try it 20 different times before something hits you with the way that you appreciate yoga. Just because we try something once and don't like it doesn't mean that we won't come back to it again. Some people find it when they're young, some people find it when they're a little bit older. It's really nice to know that everyone's gonna have their own little story or way that they've found their way into a yoga practice. And I love hearing about how everyone finds their way. So if you do wanna share with me how you found your way into yoga, I'd love to, love to hear. Second last on the list is that self-practice will help you learn what feels good in your own body. I never really understood what a self-practice was or a home practice was till I was on my teacher training. They really encourage us to try our own practice and it was mostly coming from a place of teaching. So if we were to teach, we need to know what feels good in our body. That's been a really important thing for me to practice within myself to know what feels really good uh, for me personally, knowing as well that that might not feel great for everyone as well. But if I feel confident in what I'm doing, I'm going to feel a lot more confident teaching that than I will if I haven't practiced something before. And that's again, it's called a yoga practice for a reason that we, we try these things, we try these shapes and if they work, they work and sometimes that they don't. But giving yourself the freedom to move around in your own way first before maybe taking that and showing someone else or offering that to someone else is a really good thing I've learned uh, before teaching others. And the last one on the list is that you know enough right now. I think when you finish a 200 hour training, you have a moment of thinking, I know everything that there is to know about yoga and also I know absolutely nothing about yoga because there's so much more to learn and I think that's a really important thing to think of because there is so much to learn and there's so many people out there who know all these different things and we can learn so much. So what and I know right now is enough for me. I know that there's hopefully more space in my brain for me to keep learning. It's okay that I don't know everything and I don't ever have to know everything, but what I know enough is enough right now. Going over my top 10 list once again is that a good teacher depends on who I am when I'm teaching, not what my yoga looks like. To be serious about my practice, but not serious about life. And that yoga is a safe place to practice life. In yoga, there is no end goal, and that's why it's called a practice. While the philosophy of yoga is an ancient practice, the poses are really only about 100 years old. Yoga is not a one-size-fits-all. Bodies are not made, made to do everything. 
resting when you need to is important and everyone finds yoga in their different way. Self-practice will help you learn what feels good in your own body and you know enough right now. So I hope you enjoyed me sharing some of the best things that I learned on my first yoga teacher training. I hope to have another one of these episodes coming up a little later similar to this but on my second yoga teacher training which I'm almost finished with yoga for humankind so looking forward to sharing lots more of my learnings and stories with you that I've been able to learn from some of the best yoga teachers in the world and if you've got anything that you maybe learned on your teacher training or that you've learned from yoga over the years feel free to get in touch at plantpoweredyoga.com I'd love to hear your stories and thanks again for listening and we'll see you next time Thanks again for listening to the Plant Powered Yoga podcast. For more information, visit plantpoweredyoga.com or visit the show notes below. I'd love it if you could rate, review, or even share this podcast with a friend. Thanks so much for helping create a kinder world and see you next time.